All right, so here's the plan for today. Going over how you put an application together. The general concepts about application and all along the way here, we're going to be putting this stuff in our operation manual. So what we could do, maybe I'll do this here, is as I go over the application development concepts, think about the parts of the application description that would go in the operation manual. So we have your operation manual. In there is going to go a lot of the things you've already done in your systems requirements document. So you could possibly start with the SRD document and do a save as operation manual. And then in there, you've, you've already got your description of your system, right? You got your cover page. You've got your contents, table of contents, all to make it look nice. And you can have a, even have a table of figures or of diagrams. I think in the, I think in the Microsoft they call it table of figures. So table of contents, table of figures. And then various chapters of description, executive summary, motivation for the system. And then something that was not in the system requirements document was the uh, design approach or development. Uh, and in chapter 11, they've got a variety of tables there, and they talk about uh, actual, uh, application development, and looking on page 509, they show something that looks a lot more detailed than your data flow diagram. But this requires you to actually have modules defined. So I'm not going to require you to put in module relationship diagrams, because that would that would lay out a lot of details in the code that we don't really have the time to put together all that. That's, that's what you would do while you're developing your code. And different developers will have different ways to diagram their, their code. And let's see if in the PowerPoint for this chapter, whether it shows any of those. Here is sort of one of them. Let me just show this page. Here is one example where you have a structured chart showing your various modules and then modules that it calls or uses in a library. We didn't do a whole lot of this when we did Visual Basic. When we, when we learned Visual Basic, basically we wrote one module. All the program was one, in one file. And I don't know if in, in your Java, I'm guessing you're probably working with one big program, not multiple modules. And when one person's working on code, that's an easy way to do it. A nice way, you just have one file, you edit that, you add functions at the bottom of the text file as you build more functionality. But when you're working with multiple people, that gets to be a pain because you're trying to edit one file, cloud editing, you know, cloud-based programming, working on the same file on a server. Basically, if it's, if it's a decent server, it'll lock one programmer out while the other one is editing it. You won't let editing happen on, on the same file by multiple people. There's a great uh, capabilities built into Microsoft Studio that you check in and check out pieces of code as you edit them. So with Teams, modularity becomes very important. And even with the, as you develop large programs, if you're a programmer, You'll work on some things that you realize in my program here. You know, I could use this program or this function in many other places. What you'll do is you generate a library of functions, like functions that handle crazy things like linked lists, or de dealing with strings, or dealing with timers when you can't get the sleep function to work in Java, but you figure out a way to delay for a certain time without 
going 100% CPU on a tight loop counting to 5 million just to spend a second of time on your particular processor. So the multiple modules help your, de your application development to go smoothly among many people, many programmers. And even with one person, having modules helps you to, I guess, uh, make your program more stable. You can get one thing done, have it set aside, while then you go edit another module, not having to worry about recompiling this piece every time I recompile this or find bugs in this. This has all been compiled, no bugs in it. I can set it aside. Then the only problem becomes when I need to upgrade to the next version of Java because of my programming and things break because the new version doesn't do the same thing. So when you're doing software development, you freeze all your compilers at a particular version. You freeze your Eclipse environment or your NetBeans. Are you using NetBeans, Micah? So you freeze your NetBeans at a particular level. You don't worry about updating Java. You might even run away from any Java updates until you've got your program working. Then, if there is an update, you can deal with that at a separate time. We had a program uh, working in the cafeteria that was handling the card swipe, doing a very good job. And the, the person that programmed it moved to back to Mexico, and he was supporting it for about a year from Mexico. And, but his job there got busier and busier and little, you know, less time to help us deal with things. And the time we find f problems with that software is at the beginning of the year. So the next beginning of the year rolled around. We had some problems he ironed out. Then two years later, the next beginning of new students, we realized that there were some issues with going a second year and removing old students, adding new students. And guess at that point, he wasn't available. The Turbo Pascal that was written in was no longer available to us. So we hadn't actually done a very good handoff of the system to us. At the point where he handed it to us, we did not have our own copy of the compiler to be able to even recompile the program when he was gone. He was doing help from Mexico, but then when we realized we needed to make a change, I found out he, he no longer had the compiler. The compiler was no longer available. You had to update the version. And guess what? Many pieces of the code were broken if you went to the new version of the compiler. So we were stuck with a system basically no longer supportable. At that point, the decision was made. I don't. We didn't can the system. We just said, OK, we're not doing any fixes. We know there's bugs in it. We're not fixed. Some of the problems that we had, he did some decent modular coding. But still, a lot of it was uncommented. Uh, no ch charts like this to even describe have a clue. You had to read through the code to figure out what it was doing. It wasn't a super complicated program. And there were problems with coupling. Uh, coupling sometimes is good, but I think tightly coupled things are not good. You want to loosely couple things so when I change something here, it doesn't have huge ramifications all over all my other uh, modules. That's what coupling's about. And having some kind of diagram doesn't necessarily make your program work better, but it helps other people to understand how your program's working. There are some software packages that you pay a lot of money for that will take your code and generate these diagrams like the, my, like the one you might see on page 509 which is similar to this. It's kind of showing variables and parameters that are handled and, and uh, passed between modules. Depending on what language you're writing your application in, these little messages mean different things. It has to do with messages and variables sent between uh, modules. Sometimes it could be simply parameters that are sent whether in readable or, or writable parameters. If you're dealing with an event handling system, it may be events that happen in the system. So this whole module and relationship, they try to be language independent as possible. And let's look a little 
into these two terms, cohesion and couplings. If you, meet, if you make a module more cohesive, and where do they define cohesiveness? On page 507. Cohesiveness, they say there, there at the bottom of 507, measures a module's scope and processing characteristics. A module that does one thing, only, only uh, processes one type of data or performs a single function, has a higher degree of cohesion, meaning it only, it only does one thing. Can you think of an example of cohesion in perhaps our TIMS system? Think of the different functions. Think of our functionality diagram or your data flow diagram. Can you think of something that you would do or the system would need to do in our TIMS processing that we would say probably is very only has only one thing to do? You can think of things the instructor would do with the system, thing a system, things a student has to do administrator so assign it so a sign in module think of what happens in sign in you display a you display a login page display a welcome message you've got your themed graphics and they type in their username and a password and then click login at that point, what happens on the server side? Yeah, the server gets a request for a page with two form input items. One would be the login name, one would be the password field. And in there, depending on how secure you are, there may be lots of things happening. One may be first check the IP that the login is being attempted from. Is it a uh, not on our blacklist? That could be one very cohesive piece of code. Simply check the IP for, from the request. Uh, do a uh, rinsing of the variables. Make sure that they haven't typed in some uh, SQL code to try to trip up our server on their login name. So you uh, sanitize any input. That could be one module in itself. Take an input from a text box that's been submitted, wipe out any illegal characters, and return a success or failure if there's a problem with what they type for their username. That could be a very cohesive piece of code. So just breaking that login into pieces. One, uh, sanitize the, what they've typed in. And now, check the database, one, for the username. Is, it a, is that username in the database? And if it's not, sorry, unknown user. Second, now, check the password. And what usually would be done, if it's, any, if it's a decent system at all, you run your encryption program on the password and compare to the encrypted password that's in the database. If it's a decent system at all, you do not keep the unencrypted password even in your database. You keep the encrypted form of the password. So no one even that gets into the database can find out what the password is unless they go through the huge dictionary or their rainbow tables like you're learning about in security, right? And they encrypt it and then compare the, the two encryptions and they say, oh, that is the same encryption as the word Genesis. Now they know your password. But they didn't know it just by reading the text. That would be a fairly cohesive system. So is login a cohesive system or is checking user ID say Yeah, the code that we're Yeah, the code on the server side that does three things. I would call the uh, check for IP address a very cohesive piece of code. If I did it all in one module, check IP and uh, check for valid user, compare passwords, 
that's less cohesive because it's doing more things. They're related, but they're not as cohesive because the check the IP and all the issues dealing with do I have a table of valid IPs, do I have a blacklist, I would probably make that into one separate little function to be as cohesive as possible, I would make that a separate module. Call it uh, 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 source validation, source IP validation. And notice, I don't have to care about encryption or, or databases if all I'm checking for is the source IP. The module that needs to worry about is my, is it a valid username and password? It has to know, it has to have access to the database. So if there are database issues, my check the IP source code doesn't break because it has a different set of things to do. Un unless, of course, in the database I have something to deal with what's my list of valid IPs. And keeping a, and it's maybe I'm keeping a table of transactions and, and IPs that have made connections. But like a lot of systems do, that may be a separate. That may be a whole separate module of dealing with logging of the source IPs that have, that have visited my site, uh, watching for robots. If I get the same hit every half a second from the same IP address, I don't even check. I don't even talk to the to the check for valid user and slow down my database. I immediately throw out that attempt and never get to the the login part. And that's that's a serious issue with some webs and, and with any web-based system is you got to think, okay, what if there's a robot trying to hack in and or just trying to bring down my system? And every half a second, I'm getting a, a request for a login. I better do something or I'm going down because all I'm going to be doing is servicing some invalid robot. What systems do is they'll, they'll have checks for, for uh, that kind of activity, and they will uh, set a flag in the system to e to completely ignore any messages from that IP and not even process it anymore. Because if you do, if you're continually trying to process a transaction, you will it, you'll get a you'll be vulnerable to a denial of service. And that's a whole field of security of just just watching and uh, uh, blocking access, not having it slow down my check for the valid user uh, code. And again, if it's if it's tight, if it's cohesive, that little piece of code doesn't have to worry about, and, and the code that deals with logins never even gets called because it's nicely cohesive. Watch for bad IP addresses. Don't even bother the system any further. If it were one, if it were not cohesive, you you still may have the logic in the in your code working, but when someone needs to edit it, they'll only edit the database login part. And they still have this big section in the code that hopefully they never touch. But it's safer to have that little piece dealing with one specific function in its separate piece of code. You cannot, you don't ever have to touch it. You don't have to worry, oh, it got edited. Did that part of the code get edited that we shouldn't have changed? And the same thing goes for the coupling idea has to do with... Uh, the degree of interdependence among modules. So even if one module does only one thing, if there are global variables, that's one of the worst things for programming to make things closely coupled. You do not want you you don't don't want them tightly coupled. And global variables tend to make your code tightly coupled. Where if you're depending on a particular global variable, you don't know who are else in your program that might be getting changed and your code can completely blow up if one little function thought that this was how we were using this global variable. And now I'm sending it to zero. Uh-oh, this guy over here divides by that variable, and now you got to divide by zero error. And that's where, as the developing goes on, in your, and of course, a lot of this, the, if you've done good data flow diagrams, these structures almost fall out of the data flow diagrams. The, if you've done the data flow, correctly. So what you could do in your operation manual, if I'm going to try to follow uh, and describe my code, in the uh, structure chart, 
in your manual, you could t do something like uh, take your data flow diagram and just kind of uh, redraw similar to the diagram on 509. Say our code followed so from the based on our data flow diagram or our uh, our lower level data flow diagrams. Here is the expected structure of our code. So it would be a it would not be the context diagram. It would be a lower level data flow, and you could you could have one or two showing. Here's the planned structure, and you could even mention in your caption. Based, uh, this was based on our original design from our data flow diagram. So, uh, and you see there on the arrows now, they're basically putting in details of what's going on that data line uh, on page 509 there. Oh, and I think here, let's bring up this one. Uh, here, if I zoom in, can I zoom in on that? Uh, I guess, power, oh, the PowerPoint does let me zoom in. If I zoom in on that, you'll see these are details basically about the data flowing between two modules where instead of just saying customer information you re, you showing that you're sending back variables of what the new balance is and depending on the language you're using that's where this may may show differently it may be a it may be a, a list it may be a a pointer to a new balance. It may be a confirmation and then the new balance is available in the database. Any, any questions about that? So in your in your operations manual when you're talking when you have a section regarding uh, application design or application structure you could have a you could have a, a chapter called Act Application Code or Development Structure. You could have a structure chart similar to a data flow with simply little arrows added, and you could make up variables that might be sent between, uh, between modules. And you don't have to diagram your whole system. You could say, uh, here is one section of our structure uh, as as programmed by our our uh, programmers to make it more cohesive, loosely coupled, highly cohesive, loosely coupled is the goal. As an example of our highly cohesive and loosely coupled system software, illustrated below is a structure chart of the check for grade context or or or. Uh, grade homework process. So you don't have to draw the whole system, but maybe throw in one structure chart. And in a full operation manual, a system might have its full structure chart drawn out as part of its operation manual. And remember the operation manual has multiple purposes. It's there for uh, troubleshooters, that are maybe troubleshooting the code, they're going to need to see some detail about your about your software. Your operators don't need to see detail about the software. They need to see how do the pages work. What do what am I going to see on the different pages, and what do I what do I need to do? Uh, students that are coming to the system, they need a another training of okay, here's how you log in and use the system. Teachers will need. Here's how to log in and set up your classes. Yeah. Right. Uh, well, we we do have from our GUI from our GUI design, we can use those pages, and uh, you can embellish your your forms and that access, and just take screenshots of those access forms that we created, and you're welcome to to enhance those. And, and, of course, we may not have an exhaustive list of all our pages, but we should have a list of here's the main page, instructors go here, 
and then a pay, and then the instructor screenshot, and then a, a blurb of two instructors. Here is your page for handling class details. For students, here's your page. Here's what you can do when you log in and go to the student page. Administrators, that would be maybe a, a, an in page showing lots of settings that they can they can change like uh, I suppose you can make up a lot of things like creating courses, adding users, um, doing a, re a system report, doing a backup, uh, checking for a system update. Now, in, in Chapter 11, they talk more about, okay, how would we then proceed to do all this coding? And that's where it'll be depend on your coding environment and the language you use. If I'm doing Java or... Uh, I think it's, it can even be done. I'll just I'll just use Java or C++. You can use two two major packages out there are the Eclipse package and NetBeans. One thing I like about Eclipse is when I want to do any uh, Android development, it's all built on top of Eclipse. NetBeans is not as industrial strength everyone else is using it for their packages. Uh, but it is a nice package. It lets you build nice GUIs pretty quickly. Eclipse is a little more awkward to use and going from uh, building a GUI. They've gotten better at it, but it used to be you, you didn't even have a GUI in Eclipse. Everything was text-based. You wrote your program and then you got your GUI if you figured out how to create text boxes and windows. With NetBeans, right away you pop up, here's the window to work with. It feels a lot more like Visual Basic. Here's your, here's your screen, drag and drop buttons where they appear, and set up what happens when I click on a button by uh, double clicking and getting event handlers. Where Eclipse was a little more cumbersome to get going with a GUI right away. But there's many people out there that use Eclipse for developing major packages like uh, also on the on the Kindle fire and the Amazon fire that's basically Android type environment same kind of thing you can find a Android developers kit happens to be Eclipse with some special hooks in it there is no as far as I know any any Android development that says okay install NetBeans and then add this on top of it so Eclipse I'd say is a more powerful environment but also a more confusing environment to get started. So for getting started to do coding, I often will recommend NetBeans first. It's easier to get started. When you want to go full blast, I want to build something for an Android, you can spend the time to learn Eclipse, and then you've got a, lot, a whole new world of de development open for you. There's there's uh, simulators. You don't even have to have a, an Android phone to actually do build and simulate your app running on an Android. Except sadly the simulator is horrendously slow. It takes like five minutes just to start up. So if you're going to do Android development, have a phone and connect to the phone and, and in 10 seconds you've got your app running instead of waiting for that simulator to start up. And that's, that's what you want to do now in your coding. As you write code, you do this all the time over and over and over again. You hire people to do this because you don't want you want to be writing code and getting feedback from testers and a notorious thing about coding when as you write your code you learn to avoid the things that you know will go wrong like typing a zero there and you know dividing by zero will blow up your math well you forget to put the check for a zero because you know you'd never type a zero there but your users don't know that so when you're testing you want someone else to test your code from a, from the complete user's perspective because you automatically will will not type the wrong things in boxes because you know that's that's a for a name that or that a number goes there I, why would I ever type X Y Z there well your users don't know that and you don't want them coming back saying hey guess what I crashed your system 
uh, or two people crash your system because they tend to bump that space key and that input gets the wrong input and it instead of handling the error breaks. So in your testing, of course you wouldn't test your whole system at, at first. You want to get the testing done even before your whole system is available. So they have this thing called unit testing. Test the little pieces by themselves. And that gets to be a problem when the whole system is done, but I'm expecting that uh, grades are available in the system. Well, the grading part, uh, the teacher entering grade code isn't done yet. What do you do? You write little things that I first learned in, in the system. They called them stubs. Not studs. They called them stubs. Where it was fake code pretending pretending successful operation of something, such as a successful login. Without checking that the actual user was an actual user, I'll just say, okay, pretend that that is a valid user. I'll say that user's logged in. Now your code can go on and assuming that this is a good user, uh, enter grades into the grading table or something. So in unit testing, you can spend a lot of time before I have the code ready to actually, the coder that's writing the real code might write a stub that takes the same number of parameters that are expected, but pretends to perform the operation ex expected. And then your code or some or the other programmer's code can go on and test their own. And writing of stubs can be a very tricky process. Because if I realize back in my coding, I need other parameters, but I'm still letting the testers use my fake code that isn't using those same number of parameters, I have a bad test. Then when I update it with my real code, everything breaks, and I have to come back and up update or put in my real code because my stub actually had the wrong number of parameters. So the whole part of testing, that again is a whole career option in itself, being a good designer of tests to really work the system. And when you're testing, if you're a good tester, guess what you measure? What do you measure when you're testing code? What kind of reports would a tester, a code tester, return after spending a week testing the system? Well, it might be, first of all, number of bugs. I was able to crash the system entering a certain text in, in particular text boxes. So you better go fix that part of sanitizing the code. What are the kind of measurements would a tester report? Yeah, yeah. So time spent. Uh, I'll call it response time. Huge deal with web-based systems. As you add complexity, everything you're doing, although it may add more features, is bogging down the system. That little uh, fade that Windows put in, that's a huge performance hit on solar systems, solar CPU systems. So guess what? The tester may have to test on various platforms. Meaning, if it's web-based, you've got to test the different browsers. Oh, but it's a different operating system. Let's see, what do we have? What should be the valid operating systems that we should test a, a system against? If it's something we want a broad base of users to be able to use. Yeah. What levels of Windows should be used? You don't go back to XP? No, XP's out of the list now. Although, I know many stores and their point of sale systems are still using XP. And I'm, I'm amazed that they're still using it. Uh, Vista Plus. So Vista, Windows 7 with all, well, expected with the service packs. Uh, Windows 8, 
Windows 10. Yeah, I better test it against the beta Windows 10 if I want to have a future. What other OS? Yeah, if I'm going to do Linux, that's a whole other world. What what in the world can I do? There are so many flavors of Win of Linux. That's the that's one of the problems with Linux is how can you get a popular following if if there's even five flavors? That's too many. But we've got more than five. What you have to pick is your major ones. That if it's a server side, you might say CentOS. Of course, Ubuntu would probably be in there. Since several are based on similar types, instead of saying Ubuntu, you might make the more general, I'm Debian, test it against Debian Linux. And it's, in your testing, get the most generic Debian Linux of the thousands of flavors out there. You're probably not going to go against Unix, like FreeBSD or something. That's, that's getting even more granular in your operating system. Unix... I don't see on many people's lists, but the old Mac OS is out there. OS, what's the latest? The 10, 10, 9? Maverick? It's Maverick. It's Yosemite, right? So probably, you probably generally you probably go back at least three of the recent versions. So I'll just say three most recent. And I think it's 10, 9, I think it's Lion. I think it's Lion, or is it Leopard? No, I think it's Lion, Mountain Lion, uh, Maverick, and Yosemite. That's as far as I know. Anyone know the latest Max? I, I believe those are current, the current la latest three. Uh, any other OS? Oh, yeah. There's a whole other world. Android. Nicely, well, the Android is basically very much Linux, although the it's not the same. But it's if you, if it breaks in Android, it's probably broken in Linux too. So, being good at testing your code against Linux also gives you some some confidence that it'll probably work on Android as well. But I don't even know what the latest Android is. Are we at five yet? Jelly beans and ice creams and lots of desserts, heavy, whatever is heavy and sugar, the latest. Again, I'd say the three most recent. Now look at that. Even before uh, you've, you've delivered your code, you're dealing with a lot of issues with, especially with something that you want a broad uh, base of customers. And you can see then why some vendors say, our system works on, oh man, I didn't even mention well, with the browsers, Internet Explorer or or Chrome or Firefox. That's a whole nother level. Not only the operating system, but the browsers. So a testing lab, guess what? You're going to have systems with each of these on there. This is why virtual systems are so popular. I can load up one server with all the different virtualized OSs testing my programs in all these environments. And then you've got to handle the latest updates to every one of those and see if something breaks. So the testing environment can be a very stressful environment. And if it's a browser, it's like a web page, they know you only have to worry about you just hope. browsers, right? Because, I mean, it's sometimes, there. Sometimes the OS does affect the browser. It's sad, it's sad but true that the <clears throat> Firefox on my Mac isn't exactly the same environment as Firefox on my PC. And I have seen issues on my Mac where it wasn't an issue on a PC Firefox. But it's more of a chance that it's not going to be an issue. So that's why when you're when you're if you're writing web stuff, there's a and this is something we'll cover in the worldwide web course that's we're doing in the fall is uh, being able to handle when your code on, on websites uh, as much as possible, don't use something that you know is, only, is specific to a particular OS or a particular browser. It's easy to do because often programmers buy packages like Eclipse to develop a website. You'll buy what's the uh, 
what's the web page builder software? You or you use WordPress. Say you use a WordPress package, without knowing that there's things in WordPress that only work in Chrome, or only work in in the brow in, in Firefox. I've had some pages on some uh, network devices. I could only get the network device to bring up a page if I were using Safari because Chrome and Firefox added some things for security that broke the very important web page that let me control my uh, VLANs on the Netgear switches. So I'm hoping that Safari never updates that so I'll no longer be able to configure some Netgear switches for the VLAN settings. I spent two hours one day thinking, wait a minute, I'm, I'm either lost my mind or I thought there was a page that it was supposed to show when I went to this setting part. It wasn't showing up. <laughs> the, the page was blank. And, I'm, and I, then finally I brought up Safari and here, yeah, here's the 16 boxes I needed to check one or the other. Those boxes weren't showing up anymore with the, the latest, I think I was using Nets, uh, Firefox. But that's, that happens with testing. And then you finally, after, after getting your stub testing going, then they do this thing called integration test, which is everything put together. And then finally, testing. And finally, at the customer site, you have your system testing at the customer site. And don't forget to go from a, from a complete power up. I was writing code once that we did one more little fix before we shut it down to ship it out to the to the uh, factory to test. That little fix caused the startup to break. And we sent it out there said, oh yeah, we've tested it from startup. Oh, that one little fix had broken it. So don't, and, and, then, and then when you install it in the plant, you made a little fix here and there. Again, don't leave until you've tested that. Okay, if they have a power outage, does the system come back up all on its own? That's one of the worst things to hear is, yeah, it all works, but we lost power last night, and now everything's, all the screens are blank. And you think, what happened? Oh, that startup script, we forgot to fix that. And that should all go in your documentation. So in your documentation part, not only describe your code, but describe uh, the handoff and the training for uh, who uses what, who's it, and maybe even sign-offs for uh, acceptance. So you may have a page of acceptance tests and signature lines of yes, the code is working, accepted by a customer, uh, and even multiple levels at the operator. Uh, typically, you have a team leader or or uh, a manager level. Accepted. You may even have a checklist of installation. That may be before you have your acceptance test. You may have an installation checklist. So even after all the code's done, you may have an installation re in including uh, electrical, electrical uh, requirements. Because you're plugging in a server, you should specify your expected clean power, wattage, and you can make up some of these numbers that sound reasonable. Uh, cooling. We had rack mounted systems in a very hot factory. We actually bought box air conditioners just to cool the box that the computer was in. And some of the things we checked was making sure that the filters on the on the box cooling the uh, computer equipment 
the filters were cleaned once a month. So we made sure that it got on the maintenance schedule of the factory. Otherwise, if we hadn't put on that maintenance schedule, after three months, they'd be wondering, why is our system continually shutting down? Oh, we didn't put it on the clean of the air filter schedule, and it overheated. And as part of the installation checklist, you also have user training. And you have a special user training, and you could even uh, you'd mention you have admin training. I'd probably do that first. And they and you have your admin create users for all the people who are expected to use the system. And then you have, I guess for our Tim system, I probably would have instructor training. And then since students are coming, you'll probably have someone at least Pretend to be a student and make sure that the training for students is meaningful. So you have a maybe a beta tester, or maybe it's your first customer. They get a discount because we're testing. They're the first ones to test our our system. Give them a discount for being the first ones, being willing to spend the time to help give you feedback. Are these pages? There's something confusing about the page. Taking time to talk in an interview. How, how did those first pages work? What changes should we make to make it more uh, user friendly? This is something that we're, we're doing already with our Emmaus Distance Ed. We are offering courses for free so we can get an idea. Are students happy with how it's being presented? The instructor is learning. Moodle and how to present and provide content in a variety of formats for the different kinds of learners. Are we able to handle students from all over the world and turning in assignments 24 hours a day because we have one, I don't, I think there's one in England or some, or it may be in Asia that they have, they may have questions. Are we able to respond to questions in a decent amount of time? That's a whole set of new issues that come up with online. Is this documentation something that you turn over to the users? Also? Yes, yeah. You would have a manual that uh, you hand over. Uh, you may not have all the details of the code like you might have for the system requirements document, but having the structure of the code there for their troubleshooting. So now, uh, this, this would be documentation that comes along as we uh, go through our testing and then plan for installation. So this may only be needed at the time the system's delivered, but you still put it in your operations manual if they ever come back and say, wait a minute, how did we install this system? We were having this problem. Okay, according to the manual, here's the requirements, here's how we install things. Um, and they'll realize, oh yeah, at that install we were using this older installation method, that's why things are broken now. Because Windows 10 doesn't support that particular operation anymore. This will help if there ever is a reinstallation or a disaster at your customer site. They'll know perhaps to, to bring the system back up after perhaps repairing parts or two. They will know the, what happened, what needs to be done, redone if there's a reinstallation. Suppose they move their their factory and you have a system there this will help them move it to a new place and they may come back to you you may offer a maintenance agreement of when you need help from us more details we'll give you this hourly rate so these are all sections that can go into your operation manual Well, that can be a section. Your user, your user manual can be part of your operation manual. And it could be a section that is, uh, for operator training, they only need chapters 3 and 4. You don't, but that would still be part of the operation manual. Rather than making you do a separate user manual, let's throw it all into what we'll call the operation manual. If you want to have a user, <clears throat> a user manual section or a user training section, 
could even have a separate subsection that's instructor and student in your operation manual with the screenshots for the for the instructor and students. Yeah. And since we don't have a whole lot of time left, I'm kind of throwing them into one. Uh, do you want to put <clears throat> Do you want to put that together and just have that be your draft of your operation manual? And the thing about the draft is that lets me see first that you're that you're making progress. Helps you to make sure you're you've got something there and not wait until the last minute. And I can give you feedback then of here's here's some things make sure to put in. So I think we'll. Uh, I'll stop there and basically help you through then you're working working out the the template or the structure for your operation on Thursday I think I'll talk about your implement implementation options of the if you're doing a direct replacement or a phased replacement as you install your system and remember the overall thing here is if you've done this well, your long-term life of your system will be smoother. If you've produced this documentation, they're not coming back to you constantly to help need troubleshooting help. You're not stuck being the full-time support. It's a very complex system. It's often that's a job for someone simply to keep that system running. Sometimes it's one of the developers that is happy to keep his baby going because it was his concept and it's a great thing it's saving lives or saving millions of dollars for people and he enjoys working with the system but you can see that's a different kind of job than developing new systems and uh, it's a great experience though to be supporting a system for at least a, a, a year or so and then coming back with that experience to be a better developer after realizing here's what it takes to keep a system going and all through that time even being able to consult with developers maybe if you're not on the, the main developer of a team so I will put this text up on online as notes regarding things to go in the operation manual the PowerPoints for all these are, are available on eLearn if you want to kind of just review the material and study for the e-quizzes. I will right now put that up in eLearn under, how about notes for that. So I'll stop right here for the video anyway and then help you work through your operation manual template.